In this lecture, we want to discuss the Gospel of John's sacramental theology. We're going to start off by looking at some arguments uh, that claim that the Gospel of John is actually anti-sacramental, that it is in standing in contradistinction to the synoptic tradition, which promotes a sacramental worldview, but instead here in John, it wants to argue that there is not uh, an advocacy towards sacraments as they're developing in the early church. We'll counter that by offering arguments for the perspective that John is in fact supportive of sacraments, but rather that he's simply trying to go at a deeper level in terms of the nature of sacraments, then that's where the confusion arises. And then we're going to make a new argument. This is actually a creative argument that I have developed, and uh, you will not read this anywhere else as far as I know. But I'm going to make an argument about the Eucharistic chiastic structure underlining the Johannine signs that relate to this question about whether or not John is anti-sacramental or pro-sacramental. I think you'll find it interesting, and I'll be very interested to find out if you find it cogent and convincing. So let's begin with this question about whether the Gospel of John is anti-sacramental or sacramental. Now, on the left-hand side, I've listed some of the scriptural evidence that people will cite when they want to say that the Gospel of John is anti-sacramental, that the Gospel sees problems with promotion of the use of sacraments in the church's life. So the evidence that is cited for this anti-sacramental side of the equation. First off, in chapter 4, verse 2, Jesus is explicitly described as not baptizing. It says that his disciples are baptizing, but that Jesus refrains from baptizing. So people that want to say that the gospel is anti-sacramental will say, look at that. The text itself wants to make it clear that Jesus never did a sacramental action. Along the same lines, they point out that you don't have the institution of the Eucharist at the Last Supper. At the Last Supper, there is no moment where Jesus takes the bread, blesses it, breaks it, and gives it to his disciples and says, this is my body, and then takes the cup and blesses it and says, this is my blood. You will not find that in the Last Supper at in John's Gospel. Instead, what you find is the foot-washing narrative, which does not appear, appear in the uh, Synoptic Gospels. So people will point to this fact that there's no institution of the Eucharist as another indication that the Gospel of John is not trying to promote sacraments and, in fact, is opposed to the use of sacraments in the life of the Church. A third argument they'll make is this um, condemnation of people that rely on Jesus or come to Jesus simply because of the signs, what's sometimes called sign faith, that they believe because Jesus multiplies bread. And so they say, ah, look, bread to eat. And I believe in you because you're going to feed me, uh, that you'll do something for me. You'll heal uh, somebody that I care about. And that's why I believe in you is because I've gotten something out of you, uh, if you will. Uh, for my own benefit. And people who are promoting an anti-sacramental view of Gospel of John will say, see, that's an incomplete faith. People that come to Jesus because of the signs that he performs uh, are condemned or somehow held as not being sufficiently faithful to Jesus. So they'll say that's an example because if we think about sacraments, that they are seen as signs of God's grace. So this is a way in which they make the argument that if that's the case, then in John's view, coming to Jesus through the signs is insufficient. And so people on this side of the fence will say, well, that silence is deafening. The lack of discussion about uh, a theology of baptism, for example, where Jesus never says, go forth and baptize the world uh, in John's gospel, that's not there. Uh, That the absence is deafening and that The purposeful ignoring of the signs, of the sacraments, is a way in which the gospel is protesting against them, if you will. That's that's very much an argument from silence, which is never a strong argument. But all the same, that's the way they they do the argument. Then the uh, final argument 
folks will make in this camp is that they will admit that there are some sacramental references, such as those um, uh, uh, disciples baptizing in chapter 4. But they'll say, well, that wasn't in the original text. That was a later editor, what they'll call the ecclesiastical editor. Uh, So as as the gospel begins to be adopted more widely, the argument goes to make it more conducive to the faith of the wider Christian community. An editor added some positive comments about the sacraments, such as the disciples performing baptisms, as a way of making it amenable to the greater church. And so, yes, they'll admit there's some affirmation of sacramental theology, but they'll say that wasn't the original version of the gospel. That was added later. Now, what about on the other side? What are the arguments that, in fact, the Gospel of John is promoting sacraments? It sees that the use of sacraments in the church are essential within the early life of the church and part of the early life of the church. Well, the first argument is this passage that we see um, in chapter 3, verse 22, where it explicitly says that the disciples are baptizing. They're performing a sacrament. It's unclear whether or not Jesus is doing the baptism as well, but does not exclude him, unlike chapter 4, verse 2, where it does say he did not baptize. But it could be interpreted that, in fact, that uh, baptismal act included the action of Jesus beyond just the disciples, given the way the Greek reads. Secondly, there in chapter 3 again, there's in that dialogue with Nicodemus. Jesus explicitly talks about having to be born from above or born again. We've talked about that in another lecture, this anathen word that can be both uh, again or from above. Uh, But in either case, no matter how you translate anathen, Jesus says you must be born again or from above from the water and spirit. Water and spirit. Well, Clearly, that seems to have baptismal allusions, the use of the words of water and spirit, key within the uh, theology of baptism. So that'd be an argument for the uh, position that the Gospel of John promotes sacraments. It isn't anti-sacramental. The next argument is that we see that Jesus transforms water into wine in chapter 2 at the miracle at Cana, at that wedding feast. The uh, argument would go that there you see the transformation of water into wine, and this would connect to the uh, Eucharistic overtone, right? It implies the Eucharistic cup where uh, Jesus pours forth his life in terms of uh, uh, the cross, and that the Last Supper kind of prefigures that moment in which the sacrament of the Eucharist captures the essence of his own sacrifice. The next argument would be that in the chapter 6 of John, where Jesus multiplies bread, there's the use of Eucharistic terminology, words like Eucharistias, which means thanksgiving or thanks uh, in Greek. And of course, you get the word Eucharist from that word, which we refer to the sacrament of the Eucharist. Another word that's used there in chapter 6 is klasmata, which is a very unique, distinct word usually translated pieces, so after they distributed the bread and they collect up the pieces, the klasmata, into these baskets. Well, that word klasmata wasn't a very common Greek word, but the Christians used it for the remaining particles from the Eucharistic meal of bread. Uh, So today we talk about the hosts. Well, you would not go to a party and say, hey, can you pass around those hosts so I can put some cheese on my host? (laughs) You know, It's a very distinctive word that's used in a particular context, which is religiously related, the word host, when you have it referred to a piece of bread. So same thing here. Klasmata was not a very common Greek word, and it was used in early Christianity to refer to the Eucharistic bread that remains after it's been distributed and consumed by the uh, congregation. So that would seem to indicate that... uh, John sees this multiplication story as having Eucharistic overtones. Also there in chapter 6, 
Jesus talks about how you, how you have to gnaw, actually, on the flesh, on his flesh, sarks. And, of course, this connects to Eucharistic theology that we consume the flesh of Christ, right? Uh, the body of Christ. Uh, that the idea that this is the sacrifice of Jesus. And, of course, that actually that saying, many in the crowd say, this is a hard saying, we're out of here. <laughs> so, again, this is used as an argument, the chapter 6. It, while you don't have the institution of the Eucharist there at the Last Supper, here in chapter 6 of John with the multiplication of the fish and loaves story, you do have Eucharistic elements within it. And then finally, if you think about the uh, scene of the cross, when the lance goes into Jesus' side, out comes blood and water, which again represents the Eucharistic cup. And so you can see some Eucharistic overtones within the uh, passion of Jesus and his death on the cross. So you have these two poles, an anti-sacramental view of the Gospel of John and a pro-sacramental view of the Gospel of John. Uh, which one's right? I would like to argue a middle view. I would like to claim, I will claim, I'll argue here, that the Gospel writer wanted to revise his community's understanding of the sacraments. And so he does alter some traditions, but that's not to promote an anti-sacramental view, but rather to promote a deeper, more profound understanding of the nature of sacraments. So therefore, what might be misconstrued as being anti-sacramental is in fact very deliberately used as a way to move people past sort of a superficial understanding of sacraments so they go to a more deeper and more truer understanding of what's happening within the sacraments. So let's take a look, and I'm going to argue that by looking at the chapter 6 in John's Gospel. We're also going to look at the seven signs, because I, again, we think about signs, this is often connected to the sacraments. We talk about sacraments being signs of God's grace. It's very interesting, in the Gospel of John, it does not use the word miracle in Greek. Instead, it uses this word simon, Simeon, which means sign, uh, whenever Jesus performs what we'd call a miracle. And there's seven of them. Seven things are described as signs in the Gospel of John, which is not a lot, by the way. If you think about Mark's Gospel, which is chock full of, gospel, of, of miracles, or any of the other uh, synoptic Gospels where there's a number of miracles, in John's Gospel, there's very few uh, traditionally, within scholarship, only seven are identified. I'm going to claim there's actually eight. We'll get to that. But the standard demarcation of the number of signs is seven. So what are these signs? First is, they're at the wedding feast at Cana, the turning of water into wine in chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. The second sign is the curing of the deadly ill son of the royal official. They're in chapter 4, verses 46 through 54. They're at, at Capernaum. Then in chapter 3, there's the healing of the crippled man who's been crippled for 38 years there at the pool outside the uh, temple in Jerusalem. Then uh, in chapter 6, there is the uh, multiplication of the fish and loaves, which we've mentioned already. Then on, in, again in chapter 6, there's the walking on the water that follows immediately after the multiplication of fish and loaves. Then the sixth sign is the healing of the man born blind, there in chapter 9, again happening in Jerusalem at a pool by the temple. And then finally, the seventh sign is the raising of Lazarus from the dead in chapter 11. All right, so seven miracles, seven signs in, Jesus, in uh, John's vocabulary. Now, many scholars or some scholars will argue that the gospel writer had in front of him a collection of miracles. Uh, we know uh, from com early Christian commentators that prior to the Gospels, there were a number of sources that uh, the Gospel writers drew upon. You know, in Gospel of Luke, you can see this explicitly stated right there at the beginning, chapter 1. The writer says, I'm writing this Theophilus, uh, to tell you about uh, Jesus, and I've drawn upon, I've investigated things thoroughly, 
I've, you know, basically talked to people and looked at what's been written before. And, uh, you know, so you can have an authoritative account about Jesus. Um, the dominant theory within uh, scripture, New Testament scripture scholarship is that both Matthew and Luke have two sources in front of them. One of them is the Gospel of Mark. They've read the Gospel of Mark. They say, this is great. Love Mark. But we have this other source, which in biblical scholarship is called the Q source, or quelle in, in German. Uh, quelle means a source in German. And uh, it is speculated. It's, this is a hypothesis. We've never found this document, but it is, it is hypothesized. It is asserted that there once existed a document with a list of sayings and that both Luke and Matthew, the gospel writers of Luke and Matthew, said, I love Mark, but it doesn't have all these great sayings of Jesus. I'm going to put the two together. Well, a similar thing is being argued here in Johannine uh, scholarship is that there existed another pre-existing source, could be just oral, but most likely written, uh, which consisted of a it's kind of a list of miracle stories that John is aware of that's popular within his community. The gospel writer knows of this source and uses it in, uh, by selecting a couple different miracle stories from that source. Now, why would you make the argument that he has a miracle source? Well, first off, if you look at the first two signs that appear in John's gospel, in chapter 2 and four, chapter 4, they're numbered. They're numbered. So in John chapter 2, verse 11, it says, Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in or into Ace. We've talked about this in another lecture, into him. So the first of his signs. There, that's the, that's the story about the wedding feast of Cana, turning the water into wine. Then in chapter 4, when he heals the, uh, the uh, royal official's son, it says, Now this was the second sign Jesus did when he came to Galilee from Judea. So you can see, first sign, second sign. Now, from that point on, they're not numbered. <laughs> the numbering system stops. right? So when we get to the third sign, which is the curing of the crippled man, uh, there in Jerusalem, it doesn't say this is the third sign. But scholars would argue, okay, well, the gospel writer took these first two signs in his source and used their numbering system. Then he started to pick and choose from other uh, events in that source and so stopped numbering them. Now, a uh, second argument for why there existed a miracle source is that at the end of John's gospel, chapter 20, verse 30, it says this, now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written that you may come to believe that Jesus in, is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through this belief you may have life in or into ace, his name. All right, so here the gospel writer is saying, hey, I could have cited a whole bunch of other signs of miracles. I've only selected a few. And uh, so therefore, this might indicate that there's a larger collection known by his community. And he's, you could see his community members saying, why don't you, you know, cite this other miracle? Why don't you include this miracle? And I say, well, I only picked the key ones that will help you come to believe. A third argument that there might be a miracle source behind there is the fact that, at least by the counting of traditional scholarship, there's seven signs. And we know that the number seven is a complete number. So it seems kind of, I don't know, surprising that you wouldn't have more than just, you know, how did you end up with just seven signs? And so the argument here is that the gospel writer is uh, trying to say something by only presenting seven signs because there's seven days in creation. Seven is a key number within the biblical tradition. And it's saying basically, hey, uh, God is recreating the world through these signs, right? Through these seven signs, just like the seven days of creation. And so therefore, it would seem to indicate that there were probably more than just seven and that they were being selected as just a few. Uh, the other reason that is offered for claiming that there's a miracle source behind the Gospel of John is that we know that there's other Gospels that didn't make it into the canon. 
And when you read those uh, Gospels, some of them, they're just uh, kind of a listing one after another of miracles that Jesus performs. A good example of this is the infancy Gospel of Thomas. If you read that Gospel, it's this ancient Gospel from early Christianity that, again, was not accepted as canonical, but was written in the early church. And it just sort of lists, you know, miracle after miracle after miracle that Jesus performs. And so we have Gospels, or sources, if you will, that seem to just be this sort of recounting of various miracles by Jesus. So we can imagine that a similar source existed within the Johannine community. And finally, many scholars would argue that there's a miracle source underlining uh, underlying the Gospel of Mark in chapter 3 through 5. So this is not just an argument being made within Johannine scholarship about uh, a Gospel writer drawing upon a miracle source, but that even other Gospel writers did the same thing, specifically Mark. Uh, that's a, a theory within Mark and studies that chapters 3 through 5 that Mark has before him a source about miracles and is incorporating that into his Gospel. Now, the leading advocate of this theory that gospel writer has before him a sign source is a biblical scholar named Fortna. And he claims, through his analysis, his exegetical analysis, that the original sign source that the gospel writer of John had in front of him used miracles as objective facts which are the basis of faith, right? So look at this miracle Jesus performed. This is proof that he is God because he performed this miracle. That in Fortna's view, that's what this book was that the gospel writer is reading and that, uh, again, within this theory, that this Johannine community is very enraptured with, this sign source, this sign gospel. And so therefore, and you, you know, there's people that this is a big part of their faith, right? They say, I know Jesus is Lord and Savior and God because he performed these miracles. And certainly... There is a testimony to the divinity of Jesus present within the miracles. No doubt about it. But in Fortin's theory, he would claim that the gospel writer is concerned that that's an insufficient basis for faith. Right? We talked in a previous lecture about the nature of faith within John's gospel. And the claim was made that in John's gospel, faith is not so much knowledge about something, which, you know, again, miracles could kind of like prove Jesus was Lord and Savior and divine. Uh, but that could be one way to think about faith. It's a content, right? It's a, it's a doctrine. Uh, but in John's gospel, it was argued in that previous lecture, and Fortner would make the same claim, that, that faith in, in the gospel writer's perspective is a way of perceiving the true identity of Jesus, that you perceive uh, reality differently through the eyes of faith. That's the key thing, perception, not knowledge. And so therefore, in Fortinus theory, he claimed that the writer or writers, because uh, and maybe you've encountered this in your commentaries, most Johannine biblical scholars think that the Gospel of John went through an editorial process and that you have a couple different hands in the writing and then rewriting of John's Gospel. That over time, you know, it's a community document and that over time people kind of add to and expand it or explain things uh, to more capture the reality of who Jesus is. And so here we have that the writer writers of John have read this sign source and they're dissatisfied with the portrayal of faith that it offers. And so they take those signs and reinterpret them more symbolically. And they want to get at their inner spiritual meaning, which they see as the more profound and appropriate basis for faith. So in Fortinus, uh theory, he doesn't think signs are something that John wants to dismiss, but he does want to correct a mis understanding, a misconception of the nature of signs in the process of faith. That if you just sort of stop at, oh, see what Jesus did? I now know he's God. Uh, that in the gospel writer's perspective, Fortner would claim that's an insufficient basis of faith. That you have to go more thoroughly 
into the reality of those signs to see what really is being said about the nature of Jesus, his identity, and relationship with God the Father. And uh, to do that, you have to see what they signify, or maybe we'd say symbolize, um, but what they represent, what they tell us about the identity of Jesus. So, I'm going to make a claim that goes beyond what Fortna just said. My claim is that not only did the Gospel writer of John incorporate signs from the sign source, but that the writers of the Gospel of John organized, intentionally organized, these signs which are inlaid within the Gospel in an order to create a chiastic structure. To create a chiastic structure that underpins the entire Gospel. Holds together the entire gospel. Now, I use this term chiastic structure. What does that mean? And so, therefore, we need to define what is a chiasm. The way that a chiasm works is that you kind of go down one side and back up another. I'll explain this in a minute. But chiasms were uh, common memory aids in the ancient world. If I have to go to the store and my wife says, Oh, can you bring back... Uh, apples, and and also we need some lettuce, and don't forget the the uh, to bring back some milk, and also we need uh, some bananas, and uh, be really nice if you could maybe pick up some lemonade, and how about some tomatoes? <laughs> Six things. Well, when I get to the store, if I say, oh sure, honey, no problem, and I don't write this down, I might get there and say, I remember her telling us, tell me to bring back milk. What were the other things? If I put them into a chiasm, which basically means I pair them up, similar things up, it's going to make it easier for me to remember what to bring back home from the store. So I say, okay, let's see. She said uh, she wanted uh, apples and also bananas. Good. Two fruits. Those go together. She wanted lettuce and tomatoes. Good. Two vegetables that go together. She wanted milk and lemonade. Two things, two beverages. So as soon as I have those categorized in that way and ordered, it's more likely I will remember, you know, I get to the store, I'm like, okay, I got the milk and the lemonade. I got the uh, lettuce and tomatoes. Then I got the, what was the other thing? Well, I know one of them was bananas, so the other one must be a fruit. Uh, oh, apples. That's what I have to get. Okay, so you can see why in oral cultures, using these chiastic structures to help you remember the order of things would be a very helpful before you're able, you know, in a, in a pre-literate society, or at least in, in a society in which you don't have the capacity to write down lists, this helps you remember things. So what is, what is a chiastic structure? Well, in the ancient world, these, by the way, were not just simply ways to remember uh, lists when you go to the grocery store, but a way of structuring a story. Because how are you going to remember a story? How are you going to remember the order of a story? Well, if you take the story and organize it within a chiasm, then you can kind of make sure you don't forget how the story progresses. So let me give you a really, really simple example of a story. I'm going to tell you a story. The king went from Babylon to Nineveh. The king fearlessly rode his uh, chariot into battle, leading his army. The people of Nineveh surrendered to our mighty king. The king victoriously rode his chariot home, leading his army. The king returned from Nineveh to Babylon. Okay, so you can see this is the parallelism, the parallelism between these different components. So here you have A and A prime. The king went from Babylon to Nineveh, and then A prime, the king returned from Nineveh to Babylon. So the parallelism between these beginning and ending elements. And then the B element. The king fearlessly rode the chariot into battle, leading his army. The king victoriously rode his chariot home, leading his army. So there's, you know, quite similar wording and a little bit of variation within uh, some of the details, but that's easy to hold together. And then you get to the middle part. And this is the key thing about chiasms. The key point of this story is that the people of Nineveh surrendered to our mighty king. That's the point of the story. It's not the main point of this story isn't that the king went from Babylon to Nineveh. No, the key point is the people of Nineveh surrendered to our mighty king, right? 
So the middle element, the turning point where the story sort of turns, is the main point of the story. Now, you don't have to have just one a central point in the middle. You could have two, two parallel points. You see this in ancient chiasms often, that you'll have a C and a C prime there at the middle too. Okay, that's going to be important for my argument here in a minute. Now, the question becomes, well, how much evidence do you need to verify the existence of a chiasm? I would want to say you need to find verbal parallels and similar details of narrative events to make it a chiasm. You can't just do it by themes like, uh, you know, the, the, the king um, traveled and then, then the king was uh, on the road, you know, and they say, oh, there's, there's two parallel elements. Well, kind of, but you kind of need something a little more specific than that. I would make the claim. I'm going to make the claim that there's a chiastic structure using the signs in the Gospel of John that holds together the narrative. What is this uh, chiastic st sign structure? Well, many scholars have noted the close similarity narrative structure between chapter 5, where you have the story of the healing of the crippled man, and the chapter 9, the healing of the blind man. If you read those two stories, one after another, you know, first read five, then read nine, you can start to line up the similarities, right, between these two stories. Uh, there in chapter five, Jesus heals a man crippled for 38 years on the Sabbath at a pool by the on the north side of the temple, and this sparks debate with the Pharisees. In chapter nine, Jesus heals a man born blind, so again, we have a physical ailment in both. Uh, one is crippled for 38 years. The other one is a man blind from birth. He heals this person on the Sabbath, just like in chapter 5, at a pool on the south side of the temple. And again, it leads to a debate with the Pharisees. So you can see this parallel between the two. We have temple. We have Sabbath. We have two healings. We have a healing of a, a, due to a physical ailment. We have debate with the Pharisees. Uh, we also have other parallels if you read those stories. In both cases, when the Pharisees come to uh, to the person who's healed and said, who healed you? They say, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know who he was. And then there's a whole kind of process in which there's re-encountering of that person with Jesus. You know, so there's a lot of other narrative details we could trace out here between these two stories that parallel each other. And again, biblical scholars consistently say, oh, look at this, very, very similar stories. But they overlook that the other signs have a number of parallels as well. So here are the other seven signs that are normally related, uh, identified by biblical scholars. Now we're going to hold off on the Cana miracle. Let's start with the other one in green. We have the curing of the deadly ill son in chapter 4 and the raising of Lazarus in chapter 11. And if you were to read those two stories, you again would see some very common elements. So, for example, you have in both cases someone who's ill, and that person is ill before Jesus gets to them. And people come to Jesus and say, hey, there's an ill person. Can you come and heal them? And in the case of chapter 4, it's the royal official goes to Jesus and says, can you come and heal my son? In the case of uh, Lazarus in chapter 11, some of the household come to Jesus and says, hey, your good friend Lazarus is ill. Come and with us. In both cases, at the beginning of the narrative, there's some sort of delay. Chapter 4 it says, After the two days he left for Galilee. Remember in chapter 11, when the news comes to Jesus that at Lazarus 6, he delays for two days. So there's references in both stories about two days. In both cases, there's a discussion about the nature of belief as a response. And in one case, Jesus says uh, to the royal official, you all want a sign. What's with the wanting a sign so that you can believe? The royal official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. He said to him, you may go. Your son will live. Right. So the man believed what Jesus said to him and left. All right. So there's this profession of belief. In Lazarus' story, we have a sim similar thing that the son of man will be coming and uh, the uh you know, it's reported that Martha says, yeah, Mary says, I do believe, Lord. So there's this element of belief 
Um, we also have in this these two stories, uh, Jesus saying that they'll be fine. And there's um, key vocabulary like living and death, seeing, believing, hearing. We see a lot of similars between the two stories. All right, so there's a lot of parallels between chapter 4 and the curing of the deadly ill son and the raising of Lazarus from the dead. By the way, notice that in, in chapter 4, he's almost dead. <laughs> in chapter 11, he's dead. Of course, when the people come to Jesus, they report he's almost dead. He hasn't died yet. So uh, that's another parallel. Then if we go on, I'm going to suggest that there's actually an eighth sign. Now, I'm not the first one to make this claim, by the way. There have been other biblical scholars say, you know, we've misnumbered the signs. There's not just seven, there's eight. And the eighth sign is the cross. So in this sense, uh, uh, this has been an assertion made by other biblical scholars. This is really interesting. If you take a look at the Cana miracle in chapter 2 and the cross sign in chapter 19, there's a lot of parallels again. In both cases, Mary is present. It's the only place Mary ever shows up, here at the beginning and at the end of the narrative. First at the Cana miracle, then at the cross sign. Both times, Jesus never calls her Mary. He call, she's referred to the mother of Jesus. Her name's never given. But she is called by Jesus, woman. In case of chapter 2, Mary says to him, you know, they, they've run out of wine. And uh, Jesus says, woman, woman. Um, what does that have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. In chapter 19, it says his hour had come. So there's hour in both cases. And he says, uh, looks down for the cross, says, woman, this is your son. You know, the disciple that adopts uh, Mary as his mother. And uh, this is your mother. Okay, so the use of the word mother and also the hour theme. Uh, in both cases... Uh, there's water present. In the case of Cana, it's obviously taking the water and converting it into wine. In the case of the cross, Jesus' side is pierced and out comes water. There's also vessels at both. Uh, there's the six large vessels there at the Cana wedding feast. And at the cross, there's a vessel and Jesus says, I'm thirsty. And they take a mixture of, of vinegar and wine and and feet and uh serve it to him. So you can see that there's a lot of verbal parallels. We have water and wine in both. We have Mary and woman in both. And also we um, have the hour present in both. We have thirst in both. Also very interesting <laughs> that you have this imagery of wine, water, and blood. And we're going to come back to that in a minute. Now, let's go down to the final pairing, which is the multiplication of the fish and loaves and the walking in the water. Now, here, if you were to look for verbal parallels between the multiplication of fish and loaves and then the walking on the water, there aren't that many. They're both nature miracles, right? Uh, both nature miracles. So that's one similarity. So it's Jesus sort of controlling nature. But that's pretty weak. They both have Exodus overtones because the whole feeding of the people who are hungry there in chapter 6 kind of has some resonances with the manna that God provides in the desert, in the uh, wandering in the wilderness. And people, biblical scholars, have seen some parallels between the walking on the water and the Red Sea deliverance stories, right? Uh, some overtones to that. We've mentioned before that there's a lot of Moses typology within the Gospel of John. So is that really parallel in these stories? Well, not doesn't really seem to be the case. But what's interesting is that if you read chapter 6, you go from multiplication of fish and loaves to walking on the water to back to the teaching about the multiplication of fish and loaves. So this holds together because it's been stitched uh, as a whole fabric or really... Uh, the beginning part of the story about the fish and loaves is then explained after the walking in water. So I'd say that's how that's held together as a unit. Not so much by these verbal unities between the different signs, but rather because the gospel writer in chapter 6 has uh, connected between 
the, the sign with this teaching. All right, so this is the direction we have. You can see my arrows popping up. These direction we have of these stories, they go from Cana to the cure the, of the deadly ill son, to the healing of the crippled man, to the multiplication of fish and loaves, walking on the water, teaching them about the multiplication, the healing of the blind man, raising of Lazarus from the dead, and the cross sign. So, now that we've traced out all the signs and seen that there's a chiastic structure to them, here's my main argument. This chiasm is Eucharistic. It's Eucharistic. We have in the Cana miracle and the cross sign, wine that becomes blood. <laughs> the wine that becomes blood. And then we have in chapter 6 at the U-turn of the chiasm where the most important stuff is supposed to show up we have the multiplication of the fish and loaves we have with which is inlaid with all sorts of eucharistic overtones clasmata right we talked about that word and euchariston and all sorts of vocabulary that as well as uh, just the overarching sort of impulse of that of the multiplication story and the teaching that follows it that would indicate that there's a Eucharistic moment happening here. And so the whole gospel is framed by Eucharist. The two elements of the Eucharist, the wine and the bread, the blood and the body. And these other signs, which are all about coming to wholeness, to health, to life, right? Because we have the story of the ill son and the raising of Lazarus, the crippled man and the blind man, that the Eucharist brings them to the fullness of life because that's the goal of the whole gospel, to bring you to eternal life. And so I think what John is saying through this chiastic structure is that the ministry of Jesus ultimately draws us into the mystery of the salvific action of God that brings us into his eternal life. That if you perceive who Jesus is and what he's doing through the use of these signs, then you are able to come into the fullness of the life that God desires and dreams for us. It's really quite stunning. And it certainly is quite sacramental. It's hmm, sneaky sacramental. You have to be able to perceive this underlying the entire gospel to see how very sacramental the gospel of John is, how the whole gospel is infused with the sacramental view. And that maybe that was part of the reason John wrote it this way, is that he's trying to lead us to this more profound understanding of the nature of the way that God works with us and the nature of the signs, the sacraments, in that process of leading us to faith and into that eternal life. That if you see these as, you know, the sacraments as, uh, oh, I don't know, grace pills <laughs> that you consume into your body and somehow you get grace that way, you've missed it. That instead, the point of the sacraments is they are means by which we enter into the mystery of God and the fullness of God, and the life of God. And that's the point. The point is to be able to be pointed to that life that God desires and offers to us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. What are the objections that we might not have a chiasm. So I've claimed that that's a chiastic structure, that the gospel writer intentionally put details within the story to parallel up these different signs. Well, one objection could be that these parallels between these different stories are simply the use of common Johannine language, concepts, images, and so don't uh, indicate a, a chiasm at all. They're just, you know, John has a certain reservoir of terms and concepts, and so wouldn't be surprised that there's sort of a similarity between these two, these different pairs. The only problem there is, if you rearrange the signs, those parallels disappear. So Johannine vocabulary and concepts and images 
aren't that common that you, no matter how you mix these things up, you'd still see parallels. That's not what happens. Go ahead, try to shuffle them up and you won't see the same plethora of parallels. So this would seem to indicate that they're intentionally parallel. You know, possible objection is that the multiplication story and the walking in water do not share parallel languages and images, so that destroys the chiastic structure. Well, as I kind of mentioned, they're both nature miracles. And in fact, if you look at the Synoptic Gospels, while many of those signs that we just went through in, in John's Gospel, you will not find in the Synoptics. You will find these two miracle stories. You'll find the multiplication of the fish and loaves, and you'll see the walking on the water. And if you go read those stories, what's really interesting is both in Mark and Matthew, you see that those two things are linked together. Linked together. Multiplication followed by a walking on water. So it seems like the tradition has already linked these. And I think that plays a role in uh, the gospel writer or the editor's mind is that he's saying, oh, well, I don't need to do a whole lot of parallel language stuff here because the tradition has already linked these. And in the popular Christian, early Christian mind, those two stories are linked together. Another possible objection is that the chiasm should only have one element at the turning point, and this one has two, the multiplication of the fish and loaves and the walking on water. So it can't be a chiasm. Well, I've already indicated that uh, that's not true. If you look at ancient chiasms, the bottom of the U can have two signs if you want. They can be weaved together. into. And on top of that, in this case, I make the claim that these have been stitched together into one sign through the process of what's called intercalation. Um, Mark uses intercalation all the time. You start one story, you, you insert another story, and you come back to your first story. And this holds this together as a one unit. Well, I think that's what we have going on here in uh, chapter 6. A fourth objection could be that the chiasm could simply be a memory aid or a literary structural device, and there's not any evidence that there's any more significance to it theological or otherwise, to the way they structured the story. I'm going to make a claim that, in fact, that structuring was intentional. Um, but you could claim it was simply a memory aid or a literary device. Okay, maybe, except that the editor created that chiasm by inverting chapters 5 and 6. Again, you might have run across this in your commentaries. Uh, if you were to take 5 and 6 and flip them, so you have 6 first and five second, the narrative actually flows a lot smoother. <laughs> uh, and this has baffled biblical scholars for years because it seems like the pages are out of order. If you just in terms of geographic references, right, that Jesus sort of is in Jerusalem, suddenly in Jerusalem, and then he's back up towards the Galilee, and then he's back there in chapter um, uh, seven, he's back in Jerusalem. Well, if you flip the chapters, ge the geographic references flow a lot more smoothly. My argument would be that the editor, and I think it was done at the editor letter later on, not by the original author, but he kind of sees, hey, look, if I just flip these chapters, I can really make this parallelism work because now I can have chapter five story parallel chapter nine story. And that has the impact of placing the multiplication of fish and loaves story with its Eucharistic overtones at the U, at the crossroads, at the turning point of the chiastic structure, which allows the editor, editor to say, this is the key thing. And then by paralleling that with the Cana story and the cross, it makes this Eucharistic chiastic structure just sing sing about the purpose of signs and the role of the sacraments in belief in Jesus. Okay, so I claim that that's intentional, and you don't change it for a memory reason, you change it for something more significant than that. And here's my claim. I think Fortin is right. The gospel writer and then the editors that followed him were trying to make some statement about the nature of faith and of the sacraments and how they relate to the nature of faith. 
And like Fortnite claims that there's a popular sort of idea about miracle stories that these prove Jesus' divinity. And the gospel writer and the editors want to say it's not so much about proving who Jesus is, but seeing who Jesus is through the miracles, seeing that he is the Son of God. That's the point of the miracles. Uh, not to prove Jesus' divinity, but to see his divinity, to encounter his divinity, to be imbued by his divinity. And so, therefore, they want to sort of uh, readjust their community's understanding of the nature of these uh, of the sacraments through a recalibration of their understanding of the signs or the miracles. If you get the miracles right, you get the sacraments right. If you get the sacraments right, you get the miracles right. I think that's what's going on here. And so to do that, to accomplish that, they create this chiasm where they, yes, they don't have the institution of the Eucharist. Instead, they frame the entire gospel Eucharistically. You got the element of the wine there at the uh, Cana miracle and at the cross. And then at the U-turn of the chiasm, you have the multiplication of the fish and loaves, the with all that Eucharistic language and overtones. And so I think in the gospel, it's a very sacramental text because the whole gospel works, it functions through the use of a chiastic Eucharistic structure. So that's my argument. So this gets us to our final point, that Johannine faith is not certainty of knowledge, but a way of perceiving experience from a particular perspective, to see the divine infused within the messy, mundane, and material reality. We made this argument in the previous lecture. And so faith is a lens, not an object. It's more of a process than a product. And the way that the Gospel of John gets across this is by examining the key role of properly seen signs. Signs fun function both positively and negatively in John's Gospel. So, a positive example of the signs. Here in chapter 2, again, right after the miracle at Cana, it says, Jesus did this, that is the change of the water into wine at Cana, as the beginning, R.K., of his signs, the first of his signs in Cana, Cana in Galilee, and so revealed his glory, and his disciples began to believe in, or east, right, into him. So here, it's saying that these signs are the initiation of belief, of faith. It's the, be it's the beginning of something. So the signs seem to have a positive function. They have an impulse factor, they, an impetus for moving people to coming to belief. Now, shortly after that, in chapter 2, we have another example where you can see, well, maybe it's more of a negative view of the signs. In John chapter 2, verses 23 through 25, it says, While he was in Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover, many began to believe in, is, or into, his name when they saw the signs he was doing. But Jesus would not trust himself to them because he knew them all and did not need anyone to testify about human nature. He himself understood it well. So here, it's sort of interesting, right on the heels of the miracle at Cana, there's this claim that, yeah, they came to believe into him because they saw the signs, but Jesus doesn't trust that level of faith in him. Hmm, very interesting, isn't it? And then we have these sort of ambiguous examples, pulling the one here from chapter 6. This is occurs, Jesus performed the, the miracle of the multiplication of fish and loaves. He walks on water, and he's on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and the crowd is hoofed it to the other side to meet up with him again. And they say, hey, give us more of that bread. Do that again. <laughs> and then Jesus answers them and said, amen, amen, I say to you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Now, question is, is that positive or negative? On one level, you could see it as negative. You're just doing this because you got a free meal. On another side, it could be positive. Hey, you understood this is not just about signs. It's about something about being filled. It's something about coming to a fuller understanding of the nature of those signs. So it could go either way. It could cut both ways. So again, I've given you this before, but I think this is the point. I think John, through the use of signs, is saying that faith is a process. you got to go from seeing to believing to loving. And yeah, you got to see, but that has to lead you to believing. That's not even the pinnacle. You go from believing to this loving. 
this next stage. And the signs lead you there. They're your portal to there. But if you just see them, yeah, it's insufficient that there's a growth in faith. So therefore, we should think about faith as a process. And I find it really interesting because in chapter 6, which I've made the claim is a very Eucharistic chapter, Jesus takes the bread, he gives thanks and distributes it, gives it. Take, thanks, distributes. If you look at the Synoptic Gospels, at the institution of the Eucharist at the Last Supper, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the verbs, are all, and also in Paul, if you look at Paul's uh, language that you find about how what happened to the Last Supper, they're consistent. The, there's four verbs, four verbs. Jesus took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and then gave it to his disciples. Here we have take, thanks, and distribute or gave. We're missing the broke part. We could spend some time talking about why that verb, which seems, you know, we seem to have a formula, Eucharistic institution formula there in the synoptics in Paul in early Christianity. Why is there no broke? I think part of that's related to John's high Christology. But I also think it might be, and this is, this is as I call it here, a provocative proposal. Is it maybe possible that those three verbs, take, thanks, distribute, or give, parallel the three stages of faith in John's gospel? That first you have to see the signs or hear the signs. Then there's the thanking, knowing the blessing of what this is, right? Thanking or blessing. And that's knowing and believing. But then finally you have to give, you have to pour out from that. Uh, and that's the loving and the witnessing. So in John's gospel, I think the Eucharistic verbs in chapter 6 kind of parallel the three-stage process of faith in the whole gospel. All right, so with that, we get a great sense, I hope, of the power of John's gospel. And it will be very interesting to see whether you find this argument about the Eucharistic chiastic structure underpinning the entire gospel of John is convincing and cogent for you. Thank you very much.